And I'm now, I'm now in Sofia, Bulgaria, and now I'm really, really glad to meet you all. I know some of you, uh, most of you I'm meeting for the first time, and um, I hope we are going to, all of us, to enjoy the seminar. So the webinar is, let, let's, let's move on. As I'm offering something new, I guess, something which is not so familiar, I hope that you will be curious to find out what it is, zones of interculturality. And I do hope that having seen what that is, you might be stretched to think differently than you would have otherwise done. And I think that all, nearly all, we are all intercultural trainers. We all do intercultural coaching, intercultural training, or take an interest in that field of life. So I think you might be tempted to think further of the challenges that we now face as actors in the intercultural field. So these are my hopes, and I'm sure you have hopes of your own. What we are going to do today, I will tell you how the concept came about, because as I said, I imagine it is new or nearly new to most of you. Zones of interculturality, what are they? What happens in these zones? And probably the core and the real motive of, what, of why I wanted to do this webinar is what I think the advantages are of using the model in our intercultural coaching, intercultural training, intercultural teaching practice. How it all began, and I'm not going to show you the model first and foremost, because if I said, look, this is the model, this is the conception, this is how it works, you might not be convinced. So uh, I'll, I'll do a little bit of contextualizing first. It all started with a conversation on a mountainside, a conversation between a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, and myself. And the conversation was about Ladino and the Sephardic Jews. I'm a Sephardic Jew myself. And my ancestors and my parents even, they spoke Ladino. This is the heritage language of the Sephardic Jews. So it is, to some people, it is known as Judaismo, as Spanulit, it has many other names. But for the sake of convenience, I call it Ladino. Very soon, 10 minutes into the conversation, a narrative research project was born. It was born nearly 10, 11 years ago. And going back to Bulgaria, I started gathering stories from Sephardic Jews, stories about what they did with Ladino in their lives, how they used it, how useful it was, whether it was useful or not. I recorded the stories, transcribed the stories, restored them and analyzed them. The model, as you can see, there wasn't a model at the beginning. There wasn't a conception at all. My aim and the aim of my fellow researcher was to record the stories of these people. And as we recorded them, as I, we analyzed them, something like a new concept emerged. We saw that although the stories were different, although these 14 people were talking about their lives, different lives, 14 different lives, something like common ground emerged. And we found ourselves working inductively towards an understanding of interculturality. 
Towards the end of the narrative project, these five zones of interculturality model was formed, articulated and recorded. And as you can see in 2021, 2022, a book appeared, Kaleidoscope of Identities in Bulgarian and in Spanish. Why me? Why did I undertook to do this narrative project? Because I guess without sounding immodest, I had some of the resources to do it. As I said before, I'm a Sephardic Jew myself. I grew up among, I grew up in the Jewish community in one of the towns in Bulgaria. I was, and probably am, still an insider to the world of the Bulgarian Sephardim. So, since I was little, I've been familiar with this research territory. All my life I have lived in Bulgaria and I know the Bulgarian context. Also, I've done two narrative research projects before this one, and I have some experience of narrative research methodology. Having started my professional career as a teacher of English, of languages, I have this sense of languages. And above everything else, the theme has been and is very, very, very important to me. But this is a different matter. If we've got time towards the end of the webinar, you can perhaps ask me why the theme is so important to me. Now, in my story today, there will be three types of important players. Me, of course, as the presenter and as the researcher, but first and foremost, these are the storytellers, 14 of them. Um, I'm not going to say who is who. I'm not going to give you um, their names, but what is common is that they're all Sephardim. They have all been chosen because they speak Ladino, they spoke Ladino, they know Ladino. This is their heritage language. language. Mm. Wait a minute, I skipped a slide. A slide. Um, as much as they are so dear to me, I can say they're ordinary people. There's nothing exceptional that, about them of, in terms of intercultural communication. The oldest of them was 90 when I get, took her story. She is no longer among us. And she, she was a librarian and she wrote books about Sephardic culture in Bulgaria. But in terms of, un, of intercultural communication, it wasn't known all throughout their lives. They, it, nobody has heard of intercultural, among them have, have heard of intercultural communication. There is an actor there, there are two artists, there is a singer, there is um, a musician. But if you ask them what intercultural communication is, they wouldn't be able to define it. So they lived their lives in times when intercultural training was unheard of. But nevertheless, they, and I know this from their stories, they engaged in thousands of relationships. They participated in different sociocultural and geopolitical landscapes. So in terms of intercultural communication, there is nothing exceptional about them, but their lives were amazing, just believe me. Another actor in this webinar is Ladino, and I have this, or the Judaismo language, and I have this slide because 
In my experience as presenter of the narrative research project, few people have heard of this language. So let me say a few words about it. It is the heritage language of Sephardic Jews. It was and still is a spoken language, and there are books and articles and newspapers written in the, in the, in the Ludino language. How the language was formed? In 1492, there was this, um, how shall I call it, event, probably something too simple for that. The Jews who lived on the Iberian Peninsula were given a choice, a dilemma, accept Christianity or leave Spain and Portugal. Most of them, sorry about this, most of them chose to, to accept Christianity. We don't know how many, how many of them left the Iberian Peninsula, probably 800,000, probably 100,000, probably 300,000. There are no records of it. But they left the Iberian Peninsula and they left it speaking different dialects of, of this, what is now the Spanish language. So they spread, they spread, they headed for Italy, what is now Italy, for what is now the Netherlands, and they headed for the Balkan Peninsula in those times being part of the Ottoman Empire. And as they traveled, as they settled and resettled, they took with them the dialects they spoke on the Iberian Peninsula, and as it is with languages, these dialects developed and the people who spoke them by and by, due to different factors, a common language was shaped. And this language we call Ladina. It is the lingua franca of the Sephardic Jews, was and still is. We don't know now in the 21st century, how many people speak it? Probably 120,000, probably 150,000. And it is regarded by UNESCO as an endangered language. In our research and in my book, we look at the language as an intercultural opportunity rather than grieving about its lost, rather than singing nostalgic songs about it, rather than talking about it as an endangered language, although it is, I look at it as an intercultural opportunity, and this is what we are going to talk about. These are the main products of the, this narrative research project, the model. And uh, the words in it, the names of the zones are in Spanish, taken from the Spanish edition and the two books in Bulgarian and in Spanish. So the conceptual model, as I said, was developed inductively. We didn't start with the model. We didn't have a model. And then sifting the stories, the narrated lives of our participants through this model, the model appeared like one year into the research project. So it kind of suggested itself. It, wasn't, it didn't suggest itself out of nowhere because both my co-researcher and I we have an intercultural communication, intercultural learning, intercultural teaching background. But what is important is that it emerged after we have recorded the stories. Okay, I hope I have made that clear. So for 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, 
I'm going to take you through the five zones of interculturality. Because I've been thinking whether to do this or not, because it is going to take 10 or 15 minutes, but I thought um, it will be a lot more convincing to get an idea of what these zones are. I've named them the intrapersonal zone, the domestic, the local, which is a zone for the Sephardic community in Bulgaria. All my storytellers come from Bulgaria. The diasporic, a zone for the wider Sephardic Jewish community, and the international, the international community of Spanish users. What is going to happen now is I'm going to read, each zone has two slides, and I'm going to read for each of the zones, three or four paragraphs. And as I read, I'm not going to say anything so that you can have your own thoughts, your own ideas, and you can enjoy what these people are saying. So the intrapersonal zone, the way I felt exceptional when I realized that I knew a language was not, which was not typically spoken in Bulgaria. This is Aron, he is now nearly 90, and he is a businessman, a business guy. And then Andre, an artist who passed away two years ago. My sense of being an heir to this language is special. It enthuses me, it empowers me with a kind of primary and fundamental force. We seek our sense of uniqueness, and I find it in this language. It is a symbol, a token of our otherness. And two more, Greddy, an artist himself, and Andre again. Ladino gives me a sense of belonging to something larger. It gives me the freedom of choice. And I think this is super important. I can choose the culture I want to belong to. Even though it is not the language that I use now, it just pops up in certain situations. And this makes me realize that there's this language in me lurk inside me, lurking there, and Grady is an artist. So Andre says, I, and pay attention to what Andre says here, I sometimes wonder about my Ludino accent or my intonation. Perhaps they bear some Jewish traces and give me away. So, in the briefest possible form, this is what, these are the main ideas I had when I'm analyzing their stories in this zone. People reflect on what speaking Ladino means to them. It is a special marker of identity. It makes me different from everybody else. It is also their curiosity how Ladino makes them different and how it gives them a special voice. They are proud of themselves, I'm not sure, but they acknowledge their multilingual capacities, their power of choice. And I love this. I love their power of choice. Um, but also, Andre, perhaps he's the only one who said that, I am a, they are aware of the risk of being identified as Jewish. Why a risk? Why was it a threat? Because in Bulgaria, it has always been so, but mostly so during the socialist regime, the dream was of the Communist Party to have a solid monolingual, monocultural, mononational nation. And being Jewish wasn't such a good idea. And uh, also, most of my storytellers 
they revolt against the dominant image of the typical Bulgarian national. They, they don't like that. They would prefer to be seen as different when they want to. So the domestic zone, Yvette, who died when she was 101, two years ago, she says, Judesmo is my mother tongue. At home, we spoke Judesmo. I spoke Judesmo with my aunts, grannies, with everybody. And then Reni, who, when she worked, she used to be a teacher of Russian and she speaks seven languages, even now. She said, my grandma moved in with us. She could not speak Bulgarian, and this was in the 1930s. She took it upon herself to teach me Ladino. She must have been a good teacher. In less than three months, I was able to communicate with her in Ladino. And also in this zone, Andre, the artist again, my grandma always spoke to me in Ladino. When I was in, I can't see the end of my, in my teens, and my friends were around, she would still do it. She very well knew that my friends were all Bulgarian. I could not understand, and they could not understand a single Ladino word. Invariably, my reaction was to respond to her in Bulgarian, and thus demonstrate my disapproval emphatically and strongly. This kind of response destroyed the intimacy between us. We would often argue with his grandma. So it wasn't all roses in family life. Um, so at home, my storytellers shaped their sense as Ladino speakers. This is the main line going on in their stories. They talk about the ways they have been exposed to the language. They perform multiple identities at home. They're not exclusively and only and solely Ladino speakers. Some of them are better Ladino speakers than others. So um, some of them could barely speak it, but depending on the type of interaction, on the purpose, on the interlocutors, these people would speak either Bulgarian or German, some people did, or, or Ladino. So it's a diverse picture, linguistic picture uh, at home. Um, and what I found intriguing, and uh, very intercultural, as it were, is at a very young age, my storytellers learned to gatekeep and hold the domain separate. Grady, for example, would say, I knew that Judaism was the language of home, of the kitchen. Once I closed the door behind me, it was Bulgarian. It was the Bulgarian language. So diff performing, playing different linguistic identities. The next zone, zone we identified is the local zone of the Sephardim in Bulgaria. You may ask how many Sephardic Jews there are in Bulgaria now at the moment? 1,000 or so, probably 1,200. Uh, before 1948, when Israel was formed as a Jewish state, there were 50,000 Bulgarian Jews. Between 1948 and 1952, 48,000 emigrated to Israel. Anyway, there is a Sephardic community in Bulgaria. So Eli, who is also a business guy, he said, in Plovdiv, my father, which will, which will again be the 40s of the previous century, the 50s. My father used to go to the Jewish club every day. He played cards with his friends. 
and all their jokes and curses and playful battering were done in Judesmo. And then Andre again. When she was young, the same grandmother who wouldn't speak to him in Bulgarian, my paternal grandma Blanca regarded herself as a modern young woman, and she tended to speak Bulgarian only. In those times, they apparently believed that speaking Ludino was something that only the lower classes did, or just old women anyway. Competence in correctly spoken literary Bulgarian was very highly valued. So there's a lot to say, loads to say about how it came about that from a spoken language, from a language of communication among the Sephardic Jews in Bulgaria, and not only, how this language became to be regarded as the language, as a poor language, the language of the lower classes inadequate. But um, I'm afraid there is no time for this. And a little bit more, two more quotes. Uh, here is one of the reasons why, actually. Uh, Aron again, the business guy. A terrible pressure for integration was exerted, both from the inside and from the outside. I grew up in the Jewish neighborhood where we spoke Bulgarian with a distinctive accent. He still does, by the way. He still has the accent. We did not like sticking out like this. And we did our best to get rid of the accent so that nobody could tell, nobody could tell we were Jewish. And his son, Sonny, Solomon, um, this is how he finished his story, by the way. Ludino is like a live coal hidden among the ashes. I see a lot of hope in the life coal definition of the language. So in the local zone of the Sephardim, what struck me when I looked and looked and read and read again their stories was it was the most nostalgic of all zones. We are losing the language. Nobody speaks it. Young people don't care. We are losing the language. Nobody wants to know. So this is the most nostalgic of all. Uh, and, but also, but also in this zone, um, people spoke about different efforts of rescuing the language. A Ladino club, for example, in Sofia and in Plovdiv, which is the second biggest city, a course in Ladino, a Ladino choir, um, different, different kinds of efforts. Uh, and what is also important in this zone and in the stories, of course, people spoke about affiliation to both the Jewish community. People identified as Sephardic Jews, but they also identified as members of the Bulgarian society. So this duality in terms of ethnicity, I found intriguing. Let me look at them at the time. And then in most of the stories, in nearly all the stories, um, my storytellers spoke about how they communicate, how they were able to communicate in Ludino with people beyond the borders of Bulgaria. And this is what Sonny says. We became Bulgarian Jews only 70, 80 years ago. Before that, we were Balkan Jews. Should we find ourselves among Jews from other countries, there would hardly be anything to make us inherently different from each other, except 
for the language our passports have been written in. We do things in a similar way everywhere on the Balkans. I feel at home. And then, and then his father, Aron, I do business with people from Istanbul in Turkey. Half of our communication goes in Turkish. See their language resources, their language cultural resources, the other half in Spanish. And then Sami, who is no longer among us, he was a journalist, a translator, an interpreter. This is what he says. In Jerusalem, I set out to see the Holocaust Museum. Uh, as it was getting dark, I don't see. It is, as it was closed, I wanted to find out about the working hours and came across a guy from Egypt who spoke Spanish. When we finished talking, he said to me, if you walk a bit further, you'll find another guy who can also speak Spanish. So from these just three quotes, you can see how my narrators construct themselves as competent users of Ladino. There is no trace of nostalgia here. They're proud. They're proud, they stand on their two feet as competent users of Ladino. They use Ladino even nowadays as a lingua franca, they move between languages, and also this sense of common Sephardic Jews shared with people from Turkey, from Jerusalem, from uh, Sarajevo. Uh, this makes them kind of, they, you, you can almost sense their sense of self-esteem. And they, part, they feel part of an international community. And, and this is, yeah, I, you could almost sense with their body language, how from nostalgia, they, they all of a sudden stood upright and spoke about their communication with other people. And this is the last zone. Uh, the, the zone of uh, Spanish speakers all over the globe. Who is that? Um, yeah, this is Eli, the businessman. He went to Spain and he says, I remember my first visit to Spain, quite an emotional experience. I felt completely comfortable in the Spanish speaking context and was listening to people and was being able to understand. Away from home, it was this amazing sense of being in a linguistically familiar context. And then he obviously made a presentation or something. And then he said, in my presentation, I said the last couple of sentences in Judesmo Espanol. It may, it may have sounded ridiculous and primitive, but it was received well. People applauded me. I felt at home and an insider. So it is neither Bulgaria, it is neither the Balkan Peninsula, it is neither Jerusalem or whatever. He was in Spain and he was understood and he was being underst understood. And he understood, yeah. Oh. Um, so Reni, this teacher of Russian, the speaker of seven languages, she met somebody from Spain, a political immigrant, as it were, which year, probably the late 60s it was. And she says, when we first met, I spoke to her in Ladino. I was amazed that Reyes could understand what I was saying. And importantly, I could understand too. And then she says, um, I was keen, she was keen, Reyes, to hear the language. No, it was somebody else. She, it was somebody else. I, he was keen to hear the language which he had never heard anybody speak before. The time we spent together 
made me aware of the special attitude the Spanish have for us, for us Sephardic Jews. They find it truly amazing that not only have we preserved Ladino for five centuries, but we also cherish the warmest sentiments for Spain. And uh, um, Ladino or Judaism, it is not Spanish. Five, it is over five centuries that have passed. So it's a different languages, but 80, 85% of the vocabulary in Ladino is of Spanish origin. And the grammar is also Spanish. There are also Turkish words, Bulgarian words, French words, whatever, um, due to the influence and also Hebrew words. But um, it is still, the, the two languages are mutually intelligible. Um, what is interesting in this zone, and, I, and this is the last zone uh, I will be talking about, is that some of, the, my, some of my storytellers, if you imagine an axis, some of my storytellers stayed with Ladin, like, um, like uh, Eli in Spain. Uh, and he relied on the two languages being mutually intelligible. But also, Grady, for example, he would say words in Ladino and put some kind of inflection, which he imagined was Spanish. So he moved along the axis. Other storytellers, they learned Spanish, kind of basing themselves on, on the Ladino language. So this axis of Ladino at one end and Spanish at the other end is absolutely intriguing the way they were talking about it. So we come to the model, to the zones of interculturality. And uh, we come to this model, I would like to say, where is this slide? Yeah, uh, I find it I find it useful here to say what I understand by interculturality. Not that I'm very fond of definitions, but it's useful. So interculturality is individuals performing their identities through social interaction. And then, because I'm going to talk about this, here's a definition of intercultural competence. The set of values, attitudes, skills, knowledge and understanding that are needed for understanding and respecting people who are perceived to be cultural different from oneself. So, the set of values, attitudes, and skills, knowledge, and understanding compared to individuals performing their identity through social interaction. In this definition, we have a set of values, an abstract notion. In this de in definition, we put people at the front. Okay, this is a reminder of the zones. And uh, at the beginning, I wanted to say that I'm willing and can share the slides should you be interested in that. So in these zones of interculturality, you may have concluded by ourselves seen it that we move from the personal from the most personal the zone of inner dialogue to the global to the transnational the international community of spanish speakers all over the world in cuba in argentina in spain in egypt wherever also uh, here by in the visual we can't very well see it but there are no lines between the zones. 
there's fluidity between the zones. At one moment, my narrators spoke, uh, positioned themselves unknowingly, of course, because nobody knew about the zones when I gathered the stories in the interpersonal zone. The next time they were in the international zone. So um, there is fluidity between the zones. As they were telling their stories, the stories of their lives, I could see how they were talking about their linguistic, their cultural resources. They were speaking Turkish, they were speaking Russian, they were speaking Judesmo, and all languages, their knowledge in these languages came useful when they communicated with people. Now, the model in my research project, in our research project, has five zones. In some other research, some other researchers may find out that there might be seven zones or three zones. It depends on the people who are being researched, on the situation, on who gathers the story. So, um, I'm thinking of this model having a um, having power, uh, having a power of explanation for other situations by other researchers. How I use it, and I guess this will be of interest to most of you. I use it as a conversational GPS, a positioning system. Like when I coach my clients, no matter whether it's individuals jumping from country to country, senior, senior managers, senior executives, or it is a, a group, a team of teachers, as they talk to me, as they talk among themselves, I'm thinking of how they position themselves in these zones. I don't necessarily mention the zones to them, but in my thinking, as I listen, I remember how and where they position themselves. Most of the time, why I do this? Because this orients me towards what questions I can ask them, like what goes well in the period that you have been here, for example? What goes well? What do you do well? How do you do it? Do you remember having a good conversation? Could you tell me about a sparkling moment? within this month that you have been in, um, in this new location? Do you remember having a good conversation? Who were you talking? What were you talking about? Who were you talking with? What made it so good? Who noticed the goodness of the conversation? What did they say? So by following their story, the, the model, helps me, um, helps me, guides me towards the questions I want to ask. So this is one way I use the model. Another way I use the model, depending on the, on the story they tell me or the stories, depending on the conversation they have, I might draw the visual for them or ask them to draw the visual for their zones of interculturality. And visualizing their experience, their new experiences, helps them tell me more and more and more stories. And I do assume that they are competent to telling me about their experience to find their way forward. 
what else have we got here? So this is the last slide I have. I found, find this model, what are the benefits? I find it simple. It is not easy, but I find it simple compared to more complicated models of knowledge and skills and attitudes and awareness and what have you. In my practice, I find it simpler and simpler to work with. If we reach the drawing of the visual, if we visualize the situations and the sites my clients move within, then the stories come on their own. It is easy for people to tell me their stories. And what I find really valuable bearing in mind the telling of stories and the conversational mode, I find this way of working descriptive rather than evaluative. What we talk about is what happens on the surface. We don't go under. We don't go, so much happens on the surface. And so much there is to be noticed and to be spoken about that there is no need to go under. If something needs to be said, it comes to the surface. We don't need to read between the lines. So this is my one of the principles I work by. So description is something I really value. And... Um, I find this way of working really dynamic because it suggests change by the lines not being hard, being fluid. The model suggests change. We can move from one zone to another very easily. Well, if I compare the intercultural competence model here, according to this model, there is a measure. There is a level of skills. There is a level of knowledge one needs to reach. And that's it. You're competent or you're not competent. And we know, and I think all of you will agree with us that in one situation, you can be super competent, and the next moment you can fail, horribly fail, as a competent intercultural speaker or user. So the, 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 in, the zones of intercultural conception doesn't, um, doesn't say you're competent or not. You're just describing your experience. And what I find really important, and it relates to, I have a choice, which culture to belong to, which language to use. If the, in the zones of interculturality model puts it all in the hands of the speaker because they tell you, they tell each other if it's a group, if it's a team, about what has been happening. And there is no external agent, there is no competence model, there are no organizations which are there to certify you as competent or not. So this is what I have to say. Um, like the few benefits I have discovered, I have noticed, gives me the hope that I can continue using the model. And I hope it gives you some hope as well. I'm done. Thank you, Leah, so much. Um, I see that Heather uh, has raised her hand. And I would like to ask you something. Heather, please, could you put your, uh, your question in the chat? 
And as for the rest uh, of you that uh, express the interest uh, of receiving uh, Leah's slides, um, uh, I would like you please to send us uh, to send an email to Theatre Europa um, uh, virtual events so uh, we can share Leah's slides. Mm -hmm. um, let me see, Leah. I suppose you can see the. the... Yes, uh, but I need to. There's so many. Yeah. Like... <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, so um, I think I have that. What is Heather saying? I need to leave. Thank you, Leah, and Sieta Europa. Okay, <laughs> that was not a question. Okay, right. Um, Why any is the questions? Topic so important to you. Yeah, no. Uh, any questions that you would like to. Uh -huh. um, Why is this topic so important to you, Leah? Uh, Laurie Bach yeah. is asking. No, <laughs> sorry. Isn't... It wasn't at the beginning, it wasn't so important to me it, because I've, um, um, I was born in a Sephardic family and I lived as, as a small girl in a Sephardic community, but I, I went to a Bulgarian school, I had Bulgarian friends, I taught in a Bulgarian school, I, I was at the Bulgarian university, I was a, Bulga a teacher of English in a Bulgarian school. So it wasn't so important to me, but by and by, I, um, as I was gathering the stories from the Ladino speakers, <clears throat> um, you know, an identity emerged. It wasn't there. I don't think we have an identity within ourselves. I don't think we have. I think we, we perform it. Uh, we play our identities, and I didn't know I, I could play that identity, but as I knew more and more of the Sephardic Jews, as I read their stories, I thought, ah, oh, this Sephardic origin, because I don't speak Ladino, by the way, this Sephardic origin, this Sephardic heritage is important to me. And uh, at one point, when my dad was still alive, I remember him saying, you are not a Jew, Leah. You are not Jewish at all. You are a Bulgarian woman. And I thought, if I do this research, I will be kind of uh, giving a gift to my parents and to the whole of the Sephardic community in Bulgaria. This will be my contribution when I'm no more. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Um, Peter is asking, Leah, mm -hmm. uh, whether uh, Ladino, is Ladino <laughs> used in the, in the written medium as well? Is Ladino what? Used mm -hmm. in the written medium as well. Is there a written yes, tradition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in a very limited way nowadays, there is a newspaper um, produced, issued in Turkey, in Istanbul, and this newspaper has, comes out in 10 pages, say, and two or four pages are done in Ladino. Uh, also, one of the attempts to revive Ladino uh, is... Uh, is online, one category of attempts. And there are three or four online sites where people speak, communicate only in Ladino. And I was trying to contribute once in English and I was banned from the site. They said to me, the administrator, we don't communicate in English, we communicate in Ladino only. And there are books in Ladino uh, still in libraries, who reads them? I have no idea. But it was used as a, there were books in Ludino. For example, Andre's grandma, Grandma Blanca, read books in Ludino. Also, Granny's grandma ordered books from uh, Sarajevo, from um, Thessaloniki, from Istanbul. Beautiful books in Ludino. All right, let me see if there is any question left. No, nope. I only see uh, a very positive comments about the information you shared. And uh, if there are no more comments, 
Yeah, very interesting, Anis Marian. All right. Um, beautiful language. All right. Okay, so some some interesting comments on um, on the information you shared, uh, Leah. So um, if there are no more questions, oh yeah, there is one more from Rebecca. Um, and we finish with this one. Are the inner songs harder to reach via storytelling? Say it again, please. Are they... Yes, are the inner zones yes. harder to reach uh, in the model eh, of your model? Mm -hmm. uh, are they harder to reach via um, a storytelling? No, not at all. No, everybody, everybody was talking about. I think this was the question. I hope I'm answering the question. Everybody was talking about what Dino means to them, what Ladino means to them. Mm -hmm. Everybody was talking. Sometimes it was painful, as in the case of Andre, when he said, because as a kid, this artist spoke only Ladino, living with his grandma. Uh, and indeed, he had a, an accent when he spoke Bulgarian. And we went to school together, by the way. And as a kid, I couldn't detect his accent. But um, as we were talking and, and we, we met outside the storytelling session, I could detect his uh, Jewish accent. So it was painful. He didn't want to be uh, seen as Jewish. And, and also, I, I haven't got it as a quote here, but at one point he said, I have put a wall, a hard wall, between things Jewish, things Bulgarian, and I don't mix them. There is no door there. Mm -hmm. so sometimes it's it's really, really painful. So um, I see a comment from Pamela saying that um, this is very similar to the diversity wheel. What is the comment? Uh, Pamela says that this um, uh, is very similar. Some similarities. There are some interesting framework. First of all, I see similarities with the diversity wheel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um... Is that the question about the same? Yeah, it is just a, an interesting comment. That, yeah. Um, yeah. It is an interesting framework. So um, very interesting comments. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to attend this webinar in the name of CHR Europa. We are always, always grateful that you take an interest in our activities. And thank you so much, Leah, for taking uh, your time and giving us your expertise on this particular matter. Um, we hopefully will see you again, giving us uh, another interesting webinar this year. Thank you. I'm just, that's a spoiler, okay? That's a spoiler, but uh, for everybody to be on the lookout. Thank you so much, everybody. And, Thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you. Have a very, very uh, peaceful evening. Goodbye. Thank you.